Carol Parker, the Senior Vice Provost here at UAM. And tonight is my great honor to welcome you and thank you for joining us here this evening. This is UN University of New Mexico's 61st Annual Research Lecture. And before we begin tonight, I'd like to take a moment to recognize some distinguished guests who have joined us tonight. I'd like to welcome and recognize UNM Regent uh, Bradley Hosmer and Mrs. Hosmer. Thank you very much for joining us. And tonight is all about celebrating the achievements of Professor Lawrence Guy Strauss, the Leslie Spear Distinguished Professor of Anthropology. And tonight we're going to present him with this year's annual research lecture. This is the highest honor for research and creativity that the UNM faculty can bestow on the college. The University of New Mexico places a high value on the research and prides itself as being designated by the Carnegie Foundation as a doctoral university yeah. highest research activity. This is a designation reserved for universities actively engaged in research in a broad range of disciplines and fields. We recognize that among our faculty, there exists a great pool of talent that contributes to the advancement of our research mission. And tonight, I would like to take the opportunity to personally recognize and honor Professor Strauss for his countless contributions and leadership in this effort. In addition to Dr. Strauss's significant research contributions, this semester is his 82nd and final semester of teaching at the University of New Mexico. We look forward to his lecture titled Life and Death During the Last Paleolithic human adaptations in the Mineral Cave, Cantabrian Spain, and beyond. I would now like to welcome to the stage Professor Donald Grayson. Professor Grayson is an expert in human paleontology in the Department of Anthropology and in the Quaternary Research Center at the University of Washington. Professor Grayson will introduce our lecturer tonight.
students. Eight of those students got their PhDs under Lawrence's mentorship. Five of those eight had extremely prestigious National Science Foundation doctoral dissertation uh, research improvement grant. He's published an astonishing variety of archaeological work, over 500 of them. The cumulative impact of those works has been to fundamentally alter our understanding of the nature of Neanderthals and early modern humans in southwestern Europe, among many other things. When he learned that I'd been introducing him tonight, Lawrence asked me to make sure I mentioned two things, neither of which had very much to do with him. First, he wanted me to mention Leslie Spear, an anthropologist who was at the University of New Mexico from 1939 to 1955. In fact, Leslie Spear gave the very first University of New Mexico annual research lecture in 1954. So Lawrence is very much following in his tracks here. In addition, as we have learned, Leslie Spear provided his name to the position that Lawrence now holds since he is the Leslie Spear Distinguished Professor of Anthropology. Second, Lawrence wanted me to mention that something that was very proud of his internal anthropological research. It was founded 71 years ago uh, by Leslie Spear. It has been based ever since at the University of New Mexico. It is one of the two most important anthropological journals in the world in that it is one of the two most effective journals that cover, covers all four sub-disciplines of anthropology. <coughs> Lawrence has been the journal's editor for 22 years, and even though he's about to retire from teaching, he's agreed to edit it for another three years. I once edited a major journal, and it was ate me alive. I can't imagine doing it for over, over two decades and still having a career. On the other hand, I can't imagine accomplishing most of the things that Lawrence has accomplished. Archaeologists in the audience will know of that. World famous archaeologists, especially male world famous archaeologists, tend to be so obnoxious that all you want to do is avoid them. <laughs> That's not Lawrence. Everyone who knows Lawrence knows that he's built out of caring deeply, caring deeply for his family, for his friends, for his colleagues, for his students, and caring about the anthropology department at the University of New Mexico. Lawrence, one of his colleagues, said to me recently, Lawrence is the only person. Lawrence is the only person who shows up at the hospital for all of us, calls when we are sick, and sends condolences when someone close to us is lost. He fights mightily for his grad students to get funding. He treats everyone with dignity and respect. I've learned a lot watching him and only wish I'd behaved as he does all the time. Lawrence is a great role model as an accomplished and world famous archaeologist. But that just makes it even more important that he's also a great role model as a person, as a human being. He's one of the kindest and most supportive people I've ever known at the very same time as he is an extraordinary scholar of extraordinary accomplishments. I'm envious of those who have had him as a colleague for all of these years, and I'm proud of the fact that I get to consider him as a friend. So enough of me. Here's Lawrence and the 61st University of New Mexico Annual Research Lecture. Well, I've been totally technologized, folks. <laughs> I, I hope the various and sundry microphones are working at this point. Uh, it sounds like they may be. Uh, I don't know where to start. If I started thanking everybody, we'd be here for quite a long time. Um, I, obviously, uh, first and foremost, uh, Don Grayson for uh, words that uh, you know, way out there in terms of hyperbole. Uh, very, very, very thankful for all those kind words. They're exaggerated in the extreme, but uh, thank you very much 
Don and Heidi for making the trip all the way out on Alaska Airways from Seattle just, just to do this. I couldn't even persuade them to stay over um, to go up to Santa Fe or something on Saturday. Don's going to be giving a similar lecture at the University of Washington next week, and, and he wants to be prepared for that. Uh, it's also uh, great to hear that he's been elected to his second academy, the Academy of Arts and Sciences, just this week, following upon his election to the National Academy of Sciences uh, what, about two, three years ago, something, something on that order. So thank you very much, Don. Of course, uh, I reserve my highest thanks for my dear wife, Mari Carmen Rapado, who's here. So, uh, Forty, 41 years of putting up with this crazy archaeologist. Uh, it has brought us back to Europe just about every year, which is a good thing because I met her in the Archaeological Museum of Santander back in 1973, at right about the same time that I met uh, El Miron Cave in, in, in the fall of that year. I'd also like to thank our daughter, Evita, for her patience with all of this. <laughs> Gracias, mis cantabras. A uh, long list of people to thank, uh, of course, of course, also, and most especially Patty Crown, Distinguished Professor Patricia Crown, member of the National Academy of Sciences, for having nominated me and having done a huge amount of work uh, recruiting uh, letters from colleagues uh, all over the world who generously wrote in, in support of her nomination. Thank you, Patty. I don't know where you are. Where are, there, there you are, Patty. Thank you. Patty, Patty and, and, and Wirt Wills, Chip Wills, her husband, another excellent colleague of mine, have been office neighbors now for a very, very long time, and uh, uh, hopefully a little while longer, basically. Um, and I'd also like to thank all the members of the Department of Anthropology, uh, one of the great departments of anthropology in the world. This has been my, um, my professional home my entire career, and... Um, I actually started in this room. The room was bigger at the time, but I, uh, my, my first teaching experience was in this room, so I was very glad when the research office succeeded to allowing me to speak in, in it, basically, since there have been fond memories of uh, <laughs> being completely scared to death of facing a room of undergraduates here, having had no teaching experience whatsoever from Chicago. Uh, uh, I also would like to uh, thank uh, Lauren Medrano and Sally Jamison of the research office for making all of the logistical arrangements and for uh, sending out invitations and uh, all the publicity. Uh, and John Dombrowski for, uh, from the journal uh, for helping with setup this evening. Uh, Jonathan I upon Ann Braswell's impending <laughs> Moving on, uh, and I thank Anne, of course, for what has it been, 14 years of being uh, my right arm at the journal. Uh, Anne uh, is going on to happier things, perhaps, lots more Chaco. Uh, so Jonathan and I are going to be sort of uh, together with Junelle Piper at the head of, at the, head of journal, the Journal of Anthropological Research for a few more years. Right. Okay, and, and finally, finally, this... This um, great honor is dedicated to the memory of my parents, uh, the late doctors uh, Clotilde and uh, David Strauss, and to the liberation of Paris 22 years ago. What am I saying? 72 years ago. Good grief. <laughs> 72 years ago this, this summer. Uh, right. So, let's see if I can get the technology to work. No? This one then. Okay. Yes. So we're going to talk this evening about learning about the Ice Age, about uh, how we go about understanding how people dealt with some of the most extraordinary climatic conditions that, um, that humans have had to face, not only in Europe actually, but also throughout the inhabited old world at, at the time. Uh, and we're going to start the story really uh, uh, back before the worst hit and then we're going to take it through the worst, and then coming out of the worst. And we're going to do it through the lens of a cave. And I'm a cave archaeologist, and caves are places that have a great deal of difficulty about them in terms of archaeology. They're very complicated places. They're very specially um, 
um, peculiar in terms of their complexity, but they have the advantage of preserving long records, uh, long records of climatic data and faunal data and, and behavioral data. So uh, a cave like El Miron comes around perhaps once in a lifetime. I've dug many caves, but this is one which I've spent you know, a large number of years working at with my uh, Spanish colleague Manuel Gonzalez Morales of the University of Cantabria. And we have revealed in it a, a, a very long sequence, and we're going to focus on part of that sequence this evening, uh, notably the, the parts surrounding and during the last glacial maximum especially. Uh, caves, therefore, are, are windows, basically, in the deep past, as I say in this slide here. It's a cave that's located in the Cantabrian Cordillera, a mountain range that runs parallel to the north coast of Spain, the Cantabrian coast. Uh, it's equidistant between the cities of Bilbao and Santander, uh, and it's about 20 kilometers from the present shore at an elevation of about 260 meters, but it's surrounded by peaks that are only 20 kilometers from the shore or at or above 1,000 meters in elevation. And behind them is another range of mountains that go up in this sector to around 1,700 meters and which were uh, covered with uh, ice uh, at the time that people were living here in the Upper Paleolithic, a mountain glacier. Uh, during the height of the Ice Age, the coast would have only been some five or six kilometers further to the north. It's a very steep, very, very abrupt, abrupt coast. Cantabrian Spain is an unusual area because it's at the middle latitudes. It's at 43 degrees north latitude, which is the same latitude as my hometown of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in the Gulf of, on the Gulf of Maine. Today, the Gulf of Maine is very cold because of the Labrador Current, and the Bay of Biscay is very warm because of the Gulf Stream. But during the Ice Age, the Gulf Stream did not flow into these waters. It smacked right into Lisbon, basically, on the western shore of, of Portugal. And these waters were at times extremely cold, and armadas of icebergs repeatedly assaulted the shores of northern Spain during what are called Heinrich events. And you know that from ice rafted debris in the seafloor. Uh, so this is an area which is nonetheless one where there's plenty of sunshine being at 43 degrees north latitude. And so although it was pretty rigorous, pretty cold, it's still uh, an area where there was plenty of primary productivity and plenty of animals to eat. And that will be an important part of the, the story as we go into it. It's an area of very high relief with a great deal of ecological diversity within short distances. So you can go from the coast into the mountains really in a day. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, resources in terms of tool stone, stone with which to make, uh, you know, stone artifacts, uh, uh, and shelter in the form of karstic caves and rock shelters, and animals of various sorts to eat, such as elk or red deer and ibex and chamois in the mountains, and there's other terrestrial species, plus salmon and trout in the rivers and shellfish along the shores. So we're going to take you into this adventure into the deep past. These are pictures on top showing El Miron from closer and closer as you go from left to right from the, from the mountain in front of it uh, down to the, the view of the cave uh, entrance as we approach it along a, what used to be a goat path, which was what it was at the time when I first visited there, fall of 1973. Manolo Gonzalez Morales and I began excavating this site in 1996, and immediately we were in the Bronze Age. Uh, and uh, our excavations have been conducted with the uh, invaluable assistance of probably, I've never counted up, but it must be 100 or so, uh, undergraduate and graduate students from the University of New Mexico, Cantabria, and Santander, and universities throughout the Americas and throughout uh, Europe from every virtually every conceivable country. And in fact, we've had a kind of a de facto field school um, without giving college credit uh, at El Miron for many years. And, and several students, both Spanish and American, have done their dissertations in part or on whole on materials from, from El Miron. And the studies continue. The excavations were conducted mainly in the vestibule, which is an area of about uh, 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 30 meters deep by about uh, anywhere from 16 to 8 meters wide with a ceiling that's 16 meters high. You can see in the map down there 
uh, drawn by a, a, a speleologist from Santander as modified by, by our very own Ron Stauber of OCA in the audience uh, here tonight. Uh, we excavated um, uh, areas in the sort of the front of the vestibule, in the back of the vestibule, and then a connecting trench between the two, and uh, an area which we'll talk about a little bit behind a block at the very, very back end of the corner of the vestibule, which we call the burial area for obvious reasons. I've talked about the burial at length uh, before I knew I was going to have the annual research lecture. So this is not a lecture about the Red Lady. It's more generally about how El Miron informs us or gives us a window into broader, um, broader patterns of human adaptation uh, in, in Western Europe uh, during the last ice age, right? Excavation extremely painstaking, uh, various different kinds of methods used for piece plotting the artifacts and the bones, of which there are literally many hundreds of thousands. The site has very good preservation of fauna, but it's also a platform for all kinds of environmental studies of every conceivable sort. And we're opportunistic. People come along and, and ask to do this or that, be it phytolis or whatever, and even had somebody who was interested in, in lice. Uh, that, that, never, that never went further. I, I, I entertained the idea of lice back and forth uh, when in email, but it never came to anything, luckily. Uh, <laughs> so this is a sequence which is one of the longest uh, known sequences um, in Spain. It rivals El Castillo, the great site dug by Hugo Obermeyer right before World War I, in, which is two valleys, three valleys over from, from uh, El Miron. Uh, unlike Obermeyer, who shoveled it out in three, four seasons with lots of workmen, we spent, you know, some 15 or 16 summers very painstakingly digging centimeter by centimeter. And it is now dated by 86, soon to be 90, radiocarbon dates that range in age from uh, about 46,000. I learned that just last week from Oxford. Uh, about 46,000 uh, radiocarbon years ago in the bottom the bottom of where we got to. This is not the bottom of the site. That's another five meters further down, which we'll never get to. Uh, up to the medieval period, but we won't talk about that. So basically up to the Bronze Age, to about 3,500 years ago, the early Bronze Age. We'll be focusing on the period of, um, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, nope, but I've got my own, so. Uh, we'll be focusing on the period really of the Gravettian, Salutrian, and especially the Magdalenian and Epimagdalenian Azilian period, okay? So the last ice age. And this is just sort of give you a kind of a montage of uh, stratigraphic sections um, uh, drawn in pencil by me and made pretty by Ron Stauber over the years. These are some of the more spectacular stratigraphic sections of different um, parts of the, our, our trenches uh, and showing you uh, things that are representative of the different periods uh, at the site, starting at the bottom with evidence that the Neanderthals were there, but they weren't much there. They were minor presence in the site, left behind a few stone artifacts, but mainly those bottom levels uh, represent carnivore dens. There's a lot of evidence of carnivore, including cave lion and smaller, smaller carnivores. Um, and a lot of chewed up bones as a result. Followed by levels, again, pretty poor pertaining to the Gravettian period and more about the Gravettian later when we go to Northern Europe. And then, of course, the period that has always interested me the most because it was my dissertation, the Salutrian, which happened at the height of the last ice age uh, around 20,000 years ago. So we have a long sequence of salutrine levels. They're not terribly rich, and they seem to be very specialized in terms of their, their functional focus. And then there's an abrupt shift in how this cave is used. The humans come on like gangbusters, and we have a series of extraordinarily rich Magdalenian age living sites, living horizons with thousands and thousands of artifacts. Lisa Fontes here in the audience has studied hundreds of thousands of artifacts from just one part of the Magdalenian sequence, the, uh, the lower Magdalenian. And it's a period of time that's well represented in this region by sites like El Castillo, El Julio, dug by my mentors, Father Echegaray and, and Professor Freeman of Chicago. 
and Altamira itself, also dug most recently by them, but Obermeyer uh, way back when, and Sante Sautuola in the 1800s, and other sites on the coastal plain that have similarly rich lower Magdalenian levels. So we have the first one that's in the mountains, a residential hub site in the mountains. After that, there's evidence that people continue to use the site in the upper Magdalenian, but much less. It, goes, it reverts to being a less uh, popular place in which to live, and the sites that are mainly occupied are down in the valley bottoms. Uh, then there's a little bit of a zillion, and then there is a sort of a hiatus in the Mesolithic. People pass through, leave behind a few artifacts, but they're mainly on the coast at that time. And then, once again, like gangbusters, the Neolithic hits. People with domesticated sheep, goats especially, but also cattle and pigs, domesticated wheat, and that's a wheat grain that was directly dated by M AMS dating there, that, um, that strange looking object, that's a wheat grain, so it comes from the Near East originally, right? Associated with pottery, uh, and this, this represents the first full-blown Neolithic in the northern coast of Spain, very, a very late Neolithic. And then finally, there's Calcolithic and Bronze Age and, uh, and a pistol clip left over from the Spanish Civil War on the top, which I didn't put in a picture of. Uh, so that's the basic sequence of this site. And to place it within the um, climate um, picture, this is a graph from the Greenland ice core, one of the Greenland ice cores. And it shows you that El Miron Cave covers basically the period from the middle Holocene in, on the left, right, uh, down to uh, the uh, period before the last glacial maximum, back to and beyond the onset of marine isotope stage two, okay? Marine isotope stage two begins around 30,000 years ago, so we're back into uh, famous stage three, which is the time when the Neanderthals went extinct. Uh, with all these crazy uh, fluctuations in here, right? So this is the chronological framework in terms of climate uh, represented in the site, and this picture here just sort of shows you these are actually icebergs off the coast of Labrador, sort of from my neck of the woods. Uh, imagine icebergs floating around off of Santander where there are palm trees today, basically, on the coast, right? Uh, so, uh, let's see, what do I do next? Ah, yes, okay. So the, the picture that I want to paint today starts really with northern Europe. I've had the privilege of working both in the Euro-Siberian zone and the Mediterranean zone of the Iberian Peninsula, but I also had, and, and southern France, um, but I've also had the privilege of spending five um, um, well-lubricated years working with my French, uh, Belgian-French-speaking Belgian colleague, uh, a Latin of the North, basically, <laughs> Marcel Ott, and we dug a number of sites up there. So I've had a little bit of experience with the Gravettian of Northern Europe. Uh, this is a picture of Luss, and the master of Luss, Professor Paul Hazarts of the University of Brussels, in one of our trenches at a site called Ucor in the Gravettian of, of Belgium. The Gravettian is a period that's very famous because it sees for the first time a Europe without Neanderthals. The Neanderthals have gone extinct by 30,000. After coexisting for a while, either five or 10,000 years, with anatomically modern people who are still a subject of a great deal of debate among the geneticists at, the, at this moment, actually. Uh, at any rate, the Gravettian, we see people, modern people like you and me, more or less, uh, who had come out of Africa a while earlier, extend all the way down into um, southern Iberia, all the way to Gibraltar, and to, to maintain a presence in northern Europe despite the fact that it's getting much colder and much drier at the onset of marine isotope stage two, the last glacial. They maintain a presence, and this is a period of time when people are enormously inventive in terms of their technology, enormously effective in terms of their slaughter of animals. They're getting very efficient at, at, at hunting in masses of animals with very deadly weaponry, uh, and uh, are creating a pan-European identity that is uh, perceived dimly by archaeologists 
in the presence of red ochre burials that span the uh, area from Pavilion Cave, a site that Professor Grayson knows a great deal about on the Gower Peninsula of Wales, the first Paleolithic burial ever excavated in, in Europe by uh, Dean William Buckland, a theologian and father of geology in, in, um, in Britain, who believed that it was an intrusive burial of a, of a Roman, uh, Roman prostitute, basically. He was wrong. It was a Gravettian of 29,000 years in age. Well, these red ochre burials extend all the way across to Sungir, north of Moscow, at about the same age, and down to Portugal, down to the area near Fatima in Portugal. The Gravettian also sees the presence, not in the Iberian Peninsula, but many other places, of so-called Venus figurines that are found in the French Pyrenees and they're found in, in the Czech Republic and are found in, in, in Poland, found in southwest Germany and, and all the way to uh, the Ukraine and to Russia. These are people who are facing extremely trying conditions as the world begins to cool towards an eventual sort of cataclysm uh, and in which it's getting increasingly drier. So they're probably having a very hard time, but they're dealing with it with structures, mammoth bone houses in Central and Eastern Europe, with trapping of fur-bearing animals, et cetera, et cetera, the invention of the eyed needle uh, and very deadly uh, weaponry and an ideology that allows them basically uh, to communicate over long distances, probably in terms of networks of assistance, mutual assistance over very broad areas, right? Uh, but they could only hold on for so long. Because when it gets so dry that much of northern Europe becomes Arctic desert, and when eventually there's even a desert in the area of southwest France known as Les Landes, the bottom really falls out for people. There's nothing left for animals to eat by way of fodder. There, therefore, there's nothing left for people to eat. And so the human range contracts to a series of refugia in the south, the Iberian Peninsula and southern France, which is where we have the Salutrian culture, uh, centered on the period from around, well, in radiocarbon years, around 21,000 years ago until around 17,000 in radiocarbon years the Italian Peninsula and the Balkan Peninsula, where we have Epigravetian cultures that are contemporaneous uh, with them, but probably largely separated by the Alpine ice sheet that essentially cuts Italy off from contact with France and Spain. At, La at El Miron, we have evidence that Salutrian people were going up there to hunt, uh, probably mainly in the warm seasons of the year, according to our, our archaeozoologist, Dr. Uh, Marina Arroyo in Cantabria, but there are major Salutrian sites along the coast where people were living much of the year and sending parties into the mountains, such as La Riera, a cave that I dug with Jeff Clark and Gonzalez Morales back in the uh, second half of the 1970s, my first project when I came to, to UNM, having studied the Salutrian for a dissertation. This is a fascinating period because people are hanging on against all odds. But they had to surrender a great deal of territory in order to do so, and they had to invent new things, including the famous Salutrian points. And um, they're also beginning to become um, even more prolific in terms of cave art than their Magdalenian uh, ancestors. Uh, so we'll move on because time is sort of short, as usual. Just to give you an idea as to how we know about these environments, I've put on the slide um, a number of people who uh, collaborate with us, have collaborated with us. It's not all of them, to be sure, but many of them who do things from palynology to the study of uh, rodents. Uh, Dr. Cuenca Bescos in the sort of middle right spent a year here uh, at UNM. Uh, for example, she's at the University of Zaragoza, but basically these are people who study the sediments, who study the macrofauna, the microfauna, uh, various aspects of geology. Uh, uh, the late Professor Bill Ferrand at the University of Michigan, the, the greatest American cave uh, sedimentologist of his generation and perhaps ever. Uh, uh, a, whole, a whole slew of people that put together a picture of what these environments were like, from the pollen of the trees and the grasses uh, to uh, uh, stable isotopes, for example, on a variety of species. We know, as archaeologists, 
what is now being validated by uh, studies of DNA that the Iberian Peninsula was a major refugium for a lot of species, not just humans. We know that about the trees. We know that the southern Spain, for example, is the reservoir of trees that repopulated Western Europe at the end of the Ice Age, just like the southern Appalachians were in the eastern United States, right? Um, we also know from studies of DNA done on salmon and red deer from El Mirón that those two species, um, uh, which are you know, prominent in northern parts of Europe today, they were at the northern end of their range during the last ice age, and it's from there that the modern species repopulated the northern waters in the case of salmon and uh, you know, the, 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 the lands up to you know, the, the Scottish islands, for example, in the case of red deer. Uh, this is work of geneticists, both, both studies published in molecular um, ecology. Um, so one of the most spectacular aspects of Omiron is the Lower Magdalenian, and I've already said that we know a great deal about the Lower Magdalenian from major sites along the shore, such as Altamira and El Julio and others. Uh, El Miron, these are levels which are, as you can see in this slide, absolutely densely packed with remains of animals that they hunted, ibex on the cliffs, the very steep cliffs around the cave, and red deer from the uh, slopes, lower slopes and the valleys below the site. Um, they also are fishing a great deal of salmon at times. Uh, and from the studies that we have of the fauna that we know that people are largely there in summer. Probably what is going on is a movement, and this is something that I've been arguing for, you know, decades, movement in this high relief area between lowland sites and upland sites, both residentially, to use Binford's terms, uh, where the entire band of 15, 20, 25, 30 people will, will move up and down, seasonally, or logistically in the sense that you can send parties of hunters up into the mountains to acquire uh, carcasses and then bring selected parts of them back to base camps at lower elevations because the distances are so, are so short. The Lower Magdalenian is defined, therefore, in this area, in this cave, by an enormous repeated use of the cave as a residential site with lots of harves tons of um, uh, fire-cracked rock used to boil water to extract uh, bone grease from uh, the butchered animals. This is a dissertation by Yuichi Nakazawa, uh, presently at the University of Hokkaido, who did his dissertation here. Uh, they uh, focus, in terms of their um, technology, on the production of vast numbers of bladelets, these microblades made from very small cores almost always on non-local flint. And this has been the subject of Lisa Fontes' dissertation and other studies, such as by John Rosetto, who also got his PhD at UNM, on lithic sources in the area. Uh, we know that they're collecting lithic stone uh, from excellent flint sources on the coast, anywhere from 25 to about 50 or 70 kilometers away, probably as a result of their seasonal movements or uh, sending expeditions out to get uh, such materials, but also we know that they're getting materials from further afield, probably as a result of trade relations, exchanges with bands in other parts of, of the region. We know that this region has a distinctive regional band, we think, because they made these things. They made images of red deer hinds, red deer is ibex, okay, uh, excuse me, is, is elk, and they made scapulae that they engraved with these striations on them. And we found this one at El Miron, uh, very well dated. We've got, what, five radiocarbon dates that bracket this very well. Uh, they have been known at places like Altamira and El Castillo since the beginning of the 20th century. And they are, such images are also found on the walls and ceilings of those caves. So back in around 1910 uh, or so, the Abbe Broy deduced that because of the similarity in terms of the motif and the proportions and the, this peculiar technique of striation to show the musculature, that probably the people who made the drawings on the cave walls were of the same age and the same group, as it were, culturally, as the ones who made these, 
engraved scapulae. We don't know what their purpose is, but they're only found in Cantabria and in a small area of uh, eastern, eastern Asturias. So there's a regional band identity to these folks, okay? Whoops, what have I done? I've now turned it off. There we go. Okay, wrong. It, the buttons are too small for my big thumb. Um, but on the other hand, these people are in contact with a wider world. This is always the case with hunter-gatherers. We know this because, number one, there are flints that come from farther away than Barica. This is a very, very famous flint source near Bilbao, near the entrance of the harbor of Bilbao. About a half an hour after this picture was taken, as some of you know, I fell and uh, dislocated my shoulder about there. So getting me out was interesting because of oil from the, the uh, prestige that was on the beach and algae and so forth. And then one hospital after another had broken x-ray machines and whatnot. So it was a long day of extreme agony uh, getting up, <laughs> up from that cliff. And it, the things you do for science. At any rate, this is a map by Lisa Fontes here showing that not only are they procuring things from local-ish sources like El Miron is here, right, Lisa? Uh, like Barica near Bilbao. There are also flints that are known as a result of the work of John Rosetta, but particularly uh, Andoni Tarino, a uh, Basque geopetrologist or archaeopetrologist, um, that come from sources on the other side of the mountains. The Basque sector, the mountains are low, and there are a couple of sources here that have been used through time immemorial on the, on the Mediterranean side of the, uh, you know, the, of the mountain range in the Ebro, the upper Ebro drainage. There are also flints that come from sources that I knew from when I was excavating in this area of southern France, from the Chalos and from uh, Bidache. Uh, and there are flints that are coming all the way into Spain from there and even further, making it all the way over to sites near Oviedo in central Asturias. So there are networks of exchange for flint of sort of medium distance. But we also have discovered at Miron a spear thrower in the lower Magdalenian that looks very, very similar to ones from two sites in my, in my ancestors' bailiwick, basically, in the area of Bordeaux, which is where my mother was from, and the area of uh, the Charente, uh, close to the Charente, anyway, where my grandfather and great-grandfather were from, right? Um, these are the only spear throwers of this type to exist, to, to, known to exist, and we've got one of them, so this is a fairly decent distance. We also know that um, reindeer are not animals that were much hunted in northern Spain. They occasionally depicted reindeer, and there are in fact reindeer in a few sites, but not at El Miron. I keep asking our our present uh, PhD uh, student who's doing the, uh, the German woman uh, working in Santander, who's doing it, I keep asking her, well, come on, you've got to find me some more reindeer. But so far, she's only found this tooth. And it's, a, it's an incisor of a reindeer. That's been confirmed by a very good paleontologist. And it's, it's been made into a bead, you know, for stringing on a necklace or for sewing onto clothing, because these people were gaudy. They were decked out in skin clothes with all kinds of ornaments. They were quite fancy. You could identify who they were by what they were wearing, basically, right? Uh, so look at this. One of the same sites in, uh, in uh, the area of Roque de Marcon, not very far from where saint Emilion is. My favorite wine, but on a UNM salary, I can't afford it. Uh, prices have just completely gone out of control for Bordeaux wines. But at any rate, saint Emilion area, these were just published about two, three months ago. They're reindeer incisors from the site of Roque de Marcon, the same site that provided one of these spear throwers. So something's going on. We don't know exactly what, it's, what it is, but people are trading from band to band to band, from Cantabria to Istoritz, perhaps, and then around the desert of Leyland and, and over into the watershed of the Garonne and the Gironde estuary over to the Charente. So it is a wider world of social connections that these people are linked to. Conditions during the early Magdalenian were still very cold. It's a period known as the oldest dryass. Uh, and uh, we're talking about environments that were still quite open. Very, very few trees in the environment, uh, scattered junipers and pines, occasional birch trees, but mainly kind of steppe tundra vegetation, 
uh, grasses, uh, sedges, uh, erica, or, or, or basically heath, heath vegetation. Uh, however, it's a little bit better than during the Salutrian. Conditions are getting better. People are moving up into the mountains. As see in Adel Miron, where they're not just sending expeditions there, they're moving in for the summer. They're doing this in other mountain ranges as well. They're moving up onto the high plateaus of Old Castile, where there's some magnificent Magdalenian sites. There hadn't been much in the way of Salutrian before, a little bit, but not very much. They are moving back into the Massif Central. They are moving back north of the Loire, which had been the northern limit of the Oikmeni, of the inhabited or known world for the lower, for the Salutrian people, right? And they are moving back into some of the same places that they had lived before in Britain, in England, southern England, which is being gradually evacuated of ice, you know, although it never made it all the way to London. They're moving into same, some of the same caves that they had lived in before in Belgium, more about that in a minute, into some of the same caves that they had lived in before in southern Germany, et cetera, et cetera. They are even eventually, as temperatures warm and warm dramatically towards the end of the Ice Age, uh, into places like deglaciated um, Switzerland, into lowland areas of Switzerland, uh, eventually into um, uh, you know, parts of uh, southern Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, where they meet up with uh, Epigravetian people from, from Italy and the Balkans who are also moving northward. And there seems to be a meeting of the, the two sort of last glacial maximum cultures in that area of the world. So these are pictures sort of showing the expansion of the Magdalenian world, uh, pictures from um, uh, our excavations uh, in the night, early first half of the 80s on the Abri du Fort. Uh, the big rock series of rock shelters along the northern uh, edges of the French Pyrenees, but then more importantly from sites further north like Passavant, uh, Etiole near Paris, the uh, work of the team of Professor Laura Gouron, uh, a site in Old Castile, Esteban, Esteban Vela near Segovia, uh, a, a little Magdalenian hunting stand that I dug in Belgium in the Ardennes near where the Battle of the Bulge came to an end. Uh, and sites in Germany, Gunnersdorf, with these typical representations of women that are found from one end of the Magdalenian world to the other. Uh, uh, Petersfels, in a, near the Swiss border, not too far from Lake Constance, where the Rhine and the Danube are born. Uh, a Magdalenian spear from Pogenwisch near Hamburg. People are moving further and further north during this top period of time. They're mainly slaughtering horses and reindeer. Meanwhile, in southern, southern parts of the world, in the old refugia, a uh, much, much more diversified sort of economy. One thing that tells us how this world is kept together is the fact that almost every Magdalenian site, I think almost without exception, even in my tiny little site of Bois-Lettre, yields fossils, some of them perforated, that are from fossiliferous beds, they're from Miocene beds, that are known in the valleys of the Loire and the uh, Seine in northern France, the areas where people had first re-advanced. So they are maintaining networks of intermarriage, of exchange of information, probably getting together for big uh, collective hunts and wingdings of one sort or another, uh, and trading in objects like shells, like fossils, shells, et cetera, et cetera, the usual Magdalenian thing. Rebecca Schwendler of this department did a monumental PhD dissertation on Magdalenian networks, uh, documenting all the different kinds of evidence from uh, uh, mobile art, styles that are very widespread from Spain all the way to East Germany, uh, and uh, uh, the traffic in jet, in amber, in fossils, in shells, et cetera, et cetera. It's a remarkable world in re-expansion and in reconquest of places that they had abandoned um, before because of the, the climatic crisis. So a brief but interesting mention of the Red Lady. Um, many of you here were in my earlier lectures, so I won't go into the, the where, wherewithal or whatever of the discovery of the Red Lady. It was um, quite, a, quite a discovery, and I think a good way to cap a career of digging garbage my entire life. Never found anything like this. Uh, uh, 
essentially, towards the end of our excavation, I told my Spanish colleague that, uh, you know, we ought to dig behind this big engraved block. Uh, we ought to go behind it because we had some suspicion from some early scrapings underneath the goat excrement that was uh, you know, piled up in this whole area of the site that we removed back in 1996, that there were rising and intact levels, one of which was red. And that was actually worked on, you know, that ex little excavation was done by Hannah Dodd, formerly of this department, and Sergio Barres del, Cue del Cueto from the University of Salamanca. And we stopped that excavation because the stratigraphy was extremely complex and we had other things to do. But at the very end, I sort of said, mm, that area smelled good. So we went back. And first day, first day digging, David Cuenca, a student from Santander, and I hit a human mandible immediately, basically, uh, immediately. And, uh, and then the lights failed. The generator kept conking out quite a day. But at any rate, that, that was a frequent thing. The resultant um, skeleton is about 100 elements of a woman uh, who has been studied exhaustively, um, but mainly by a team of human paleontologists of the Atapuerca group at the University of Burgos in northern Spain, and the specialists elsewhere, in, including and especially Leipzig, the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. Uh, a woman of 35 to 40 years old, uh, in good health, robust, um, I've got her stats here, but let's see. I got her estimates of her estimates of her weight and her height someplace. If I can find them. Yes, stature five foot four inches, weight about 100, uh, 132 pounds. Good health. Diet we know included um, about 80 percent um, uh, meat, meaning ibex and red deer. That's what these levels are chock full of. Uh, but also about 20% uh, fish, probably salmon, and we know this the result of work by Mike Richards of Leipzig and Vancouver, or Victoria, Victoria in Canada. Um, but because she didn't brush her teeth, we know that she uh, ingested mushrooms and seeds. There's also evidence of pine, which may be from the smoky pine fires, because there's, the pines here do not have pinyons in them. This is Scots pine. So the, the pine is a bit of a mystery, but it might be just the smokiness of her, of her environment, right? So mushrooms, boletus mushrooms. This is from the dental calculus on the insides of the teeth. Work done by Robert Power, who I think must be by, my, by now Dr. Robert Power of uh, Max Planck. But it's an odd burial. At first we thought it was a secondary burial, and then we came to the conclusion, mainly the work of uh, Jean Jean-Marie Geiling, uh, who is here, and Anna Belen Marine, our um, zooarchaeologist taphonomist, who was in an earlier photo, they came to the conclusion that although no bone was an anatomical connection, that if you, and this is the beauty of peace plotting artifacts, that if you, in this case bones, that if you do a spatial analysis of the body parts, they are in anatomical position. They've been disturbed, but they're in the right place, except the cranium is missing, and all of the long bones, all of the big bones of the, f the, f the legs and the arms are gone, except for one tibia and two fibulae, shin bones, right? Uh, and the one tibia is the only bone that's been gnawed by something of the size of a dog or a wolf. They did have dogs in this period, but we've never found any dog at this site. Not yet. I'm waiting for that to be found. Milena, you've got to find us a dog in the initial Magdalenian, because that's about the age of, you know, dogs we have possibly in other, other sites in, in the Magdalenian world of Southwest Europe, including the Basque Country. So something funny happened here, and the story basically has to do with probably the disturbance of a burial that was initially the burial of somebody who was wearing red ochre stained um, clothes or whose body had been covered with red ochre. Uh, the disturbance of that body that was very uh, shallowly dug into a little natural hollow and then covered over, they dug it a little bit more and they covered her over, and uh, the, the um, the right tibia was closest to the surface, and that's the one, if she was lying with her head towards the north and her feet 
towards the south in extremely tightly flexed sort of fetal position, and that Jean-Marie, who's at the same height, more or less demonstrating this, this was her idea, uh, demonstrating how it would have been, that, that right tibia was most accessible to a bored wolf. There was no flesh on the tibia anymore. We know that because magnesium oxide staining had already happened on naked bone, and uh, the wolf gnawed through the magnesium oxide staining, which is a natural staining process in this cave, and then it was slathered again with more red ochre. They laid it on thick. They took the bone and the mandible and other bones, the clavicle in particular, and laid it on very thick. With an ochre that comes, and we now know this, we have definitive, um, as definitive as you ever get in archaeo, petrology or mineralogy, I guess, that the ochre, and this is work of Romaldo Seva of the University of Alicante in, in, in southern Spain, these are specular hematite crystals, the burial level sparkles at you when you're digging it, and um, he has sampled ochres in the immediate area because this is an old low-grade iron-rich area, mining area, so the maps are very good. The mineralogical maps are very good. You can pinpoint where the iron loads are. He sampled them. It's like the normal ochre that we have in abundance in many levels in the site. They're using ochre for fixatives and, and, and hafting microblades onto antler shafts. They're coloring their bodies. They're preserving their hides with red ochre. They're scraping it into, working it into the hides with end scrapers. This ochre is unlike any of the ochres that he sampled from the site because of the specular hematite. And the place that it comes from is uh, at the present shore, which is where they're getting, of course, the occasional, the occasional seashells and some of their flints, right? About 20, 22 kilometers downstream. And they must have visited that place perhaps during the winter season, or maybe they're just sending parties there. In any, way, in any, event, in any event, this ochre was specially prepared for this person. It is the primary grave offering of this person, is the ochre. There is a suspicion that these clumped chinopode pollens might represent actual plants being laid at that place. The work of uh, Marie Jose Iriarte of the University of the Basque Country. But to say that they laid flowers on her grave to do a shanadar is a little bit risky. It could have been the stomach contents because these are edible plants, the chinopods. They could have laid down plants at the bottom of the pit before they put her in it. So, you know, to say that it was a, a flower offering because of these clumped pollens is dangerous, shall we say, speculative, right? At, at the second episode, when they reburied these bones that had been a little bit disturbed by the bored wolf, they removed the skull and they removed the long bones. Were these her grandchildren? Did they know who she was? We don't know. Who was she? Why was she special? We don't know. All we can say is that this is the first Magdalenian Age burial ever to be found in the Iberian Peninsula, and only the second Upper Paleolithic burial ever to be found in the Iberian Peninsula. Otherwise, human bones are found scattered willy-nilly throughout archaeological deposits. We found some, you know, odds and ends in La Riera. Obermeyer found a couple of frontal bones that he thought were or, or actually uh, uh, occipital, parietal bones that he thought were cups that they had drunk out of it sacramentally. Um, but there are lots of secondary remains like that. It's typical of the Magdalenian to manipulate car, uh, human corpses. But burials do exist. Whole burials do exist in France, in Germany, in Belgium. So they did a lot of stuff manipulating them with their bodies. Right, so, so that is the red lady from the uh, uh, obvious point, except that we should mention that the famous engraved block is covered with engravings that were covered over with sediments from the lower, middle, upper Magdalenian, Azilian, Mesolithic, and you know, modern era. This is a block that had fallen on top of a dated lower Magdalenian level dating to in radiocarbon years 16,000 years ago. It's over 19,000 in real years. The block sheared off the ceiling. The scar is on the ceiling. We know where it sheared off of. They, it landed at a 40 degree angle facing the mouth of the cave. 
the sun shines directly on it at the end of the day. When you, the sun shines on that block at the end of the day, you know it's time to go home and have a beer. <laughs> it's the end of the afternoon, at least in the summer. Um, they engraved this. The block fell right before the burial was done, probably within a matter of centuries, which in my time scale is like yesterday, right? Uh, so um, after she's buried, you know, deposition continues and this block is covered over by dated layers. So we have what's known in archaeology as terminus ante quem and terminus post quem dated. We know when the engravings were made. Unfortunately, they're not much to write home about. They're lines, deep and, deep and uh, wide ones and shallow and thin ones. This whole block has been scanned and the scan of this particular bit of the block yields this. I mean, we can see it with the naked eye also, this sort of V-shaped thing. And so um, at first my Spanish colleague thought, well, maybe it's a pubic triangle, who knows what. Magdalenian people and all the way back to the Org Nation had represented uh, pubises. Um, but then when we found the burial, we started really thinking about, well, is this some kind of a grave marker? Are they in fact telling us with especially this, that behind the block lies the Red Lady, because the engraving must have been made more or less contemporaneously with, with the burial. Right. Right. We're sort of coming towards the, the denouement of this presentation, which will be in Nature on May 2nd. Uh, and um, uh, this is the father of ancient human DNA, uh, Svante Pavo, who's the uh, director of an institute at the Leipzig uh, Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology. A curious character, to say the least, but a genius, son of a Nobel Prize winner, and my guess would be he'll win the Nobel Prize someday. Here's the Red Lady, by the way, photo by Caratero and his gang at uh, Burgos. Uh, he came specially down to um, Santander, um, thanks to, on the one hand, Richard Klein, who told me to contact Jean-Jacques Hublin, and Jean-Jacques Hublin told uh, Pablo that this was pretty exceptional, he had to get his, get his Estonian self down to, um, to Santander, and we entertained him. And he took uh, samples in a lab that has never been used for humans at all. It's a veterinary lab at the University of uh, Cantabria, so it had no human stuff in it, and we were all gowned up and whatnot. The, D the nuclear DNA has just been uh, sort of released. The mitochondrial DNA was done several years ago at Leipzig. The nuclear DNA at Harvard and David Reich lab. The work there was done by Kiyome Fu. And um, to make a very long story short, they've named a cluster uh, within the U5B haplogroup the Elmiron cluster, because it's the oldest representative of this group, okay? But the ancestors of the Elmiron cluster were a, a place called Boyer, which is a cave in Belgium, very near to a cave that I dug, the Trumagrit, and which has a sequence like the Trumagrit, a site that was unfortunately dug like the Trumagrit in the 1860s, but which has been reinvestigated and yielded many human remains, going back to the Aurignacian. The roots of the Elmiron group or cluster lie in, according to Reich, Fu, Pabo, and a million other authors, uh, lie, at least in the representation, in the 37,000-year-old Aurignacian person from Goyer. It's not exactly the same thing as the green group, which is the, the Elmiron cluster, but it, 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 is the, it is the ancestral sort of um, uh, genetic signal, basically, of that group, right? So we're talking about Aurignacian. Uh, the Gravettian uh, uh, is uh, also related to these people. Uh, and then, of course, the Gravettian disappears from this entire area, right? And uh, this genetic signal reappears at El Miron at, uh, in, in calendar years, 19,000 years ago, about. Uh, uh, you know, 16,000 uh, uh, radiocarbon years ago, and then progressively younger finds of this genetic signal, this cluster, are found in northeastern France at a couple of sites, in uh, several sites in southwest Germany, where again people recolonize areas that they had abandoned before, 
And lo and behold, back at Goye, there's a little bit of green there. The, the Numeron cluster is part of this, this group of several individuals that are from Goye. Goye, parenthetically, is where we have evidence of the oldest dogs in Europe. It's a very controversial find. There are opponents and proponents of this theory, but there's an there's early dog at about the same age as the human individual at about 37,000 calendar years ago. So to make a very long story short, this really kind of confirms what good old stone and bone archaeologists like myself have been saying for a long time about the abandonment of northern Europe, the uh, refugia uh, of southern Europe, uh, and then the re-advance during the course of the Magdalenian, because these are uh, uh, late Magdalenian finds here in this area. What's interesting is that although the El Miron genes are still with us, those of us who are European in origin, there was another uh, episode that happens that's demonstrated by a site in Italy called Villa Bruna, it's that one there, uh, that shows that there is an influx of people from the Near East around 14,000 years ago into Europe, which is, was sort of unsuspected. So um, El Miron hangs on, but there's been a lot of stuff that happened even well before the arrival of agricultural peoples in the Neolithic. So the story, as far as the Paleolithic ends, in something called the Azilian, which sees the reforestation of this region first, and then, of course, progressively the reforestation of northern parts of Europe, where people hang on, hunting herds of reindeer as long as they can, uh, up along the shores of the newly created Baltic Sea into the edges of the newly created Scandinavia as the ice melts and the sea levels rise and as the North Sea finally uh, rushes into what was an earlier Baltic ice lake. Uh, in the south, however, people are increasingly turning to the coast more and more and more, a process that had begun of resource intensification in the Salutrian and that certainly was well underway with the wild harvesting of the Magdalenian. So we see a simplification of technology uh, and the ultimate uh, disappearance of cave art and portable art, the great glories of the Magdalenian, uh, in what is known as the Azilian, a kind of an epi, epi Magdalenian where people are hanging on. At this point, folks have largely abandoned uh, El Miron, passing through on occasion, but mainly during this time period, people are hunkering down on the coast. It may be that the dense woodlands are getting rather less uh, optimum for, optimal for foraging, and people are becoming more and more uh, tied to clearings along the coast, to the coast and the new estuaries as sea levels are rising very fast at, at the end of the, the Ice Age. Uh, so that really brings us to the end. Um, the story of any archaeologist's career is one of um, months, years of patient digging and screening. I've spent so many hours over fine mesh screens, I've certainly um, <laughs> lost count of the thousands. Uh, but then many, many, many more hours of analyzing uh, and making sense out of it all, leading to um, publication. In the case of El Miron, like all the sites that I've dug over the course of these, uh, this half century, more or less, 40 plus years certainly, um, has been so far the, the subject of a big monograph on the background of the cave and the uh, Holocene sequence and the chronology published by the UNM Press most recently by a, a monograph on the Red Lady, which was a special issue of the Journal of Archaeological Science last year, uh, and other publications, including lots of, um, uh, lots of attention by the popular media worldwide. The Red Lady uh, really struck gold in terms of being uh, pestered by reporters, and I think one of the best jobs that was done was done by the new scientist. And hot off the uh, uh, virtual presses, basically, this is what you can read on your newsstands, well, sort of, uh, on May 2nd, uh, the, the genetic history of, of Ice Age Europe. So our, our big window into the past has contributed a lot of different information, and I've touched on only parts of it, and I haven't talked about, uh, you know, the, the Holocene record, uh, which is equally rich and, and interesting, but that, that would be for uh, another day. So with that, I'd like to thank 
uh, everybody uh, once again, uh, Mari Carmen, Eva, Ann Braswell, Manolo Gonzalez Morales, all of the people who have funded me, uh, in, in particular in recent years, uh, uh, the author Jean Owl and her husband Ray Owl, uh, the National Science Foundation, Leakey, National Geographic, Spanish institutions, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Patty Crown for having nominated me for this great uh, honor. Thank you very much. Sure. I know that it's, it's running late, but we started a little bit late because of the high technology here, which, which ended up working splendidly. Does anybody have a, a few quick questions? Yes. I can't hear you. Uh, these are micro remains, so it's done with extremely high power microscope, possibly scanning electron microscopes in, in Leipzig. Uh, the uh, pollen are done, you know, also microscopically, the palynology, but this is stuff that's extreme. It's a very new field, this dental um, micro remains, and we even know, for example, in the same region of the world that the Neanderthals who ended up eating one another in the Cape called El Cedrone that I've had the privilege of being in a couple of times, um, that we know that they ingested chamomile, for example, as a result of the work of the same group in Leipzig from the unbrushed teeth of Neanderthals who had been cannibalized by their cousins. Uh, next, yes. Is there any work being done along the old shorelines that are now underwater that would be scuba diving archaeology? No. Uh, that would be very difficult. Uh, water is, is, is pretty deep. Uh, I don't know of any, you know, work. The only really, for Paleolithic stuff of this age, the only really spectacular instance is a cave called Kosker, which was discovered by deep sea divers, by very specialized deep sea divers, diving in very dangerous waters off of Toulon more or less where uh, the American army landed in, the, in, in, in Torch, right, uh, in 1944. Uh, there these spelunkers, underwater spelunkers, found a cave that was, whose entrance was buried in the, by the sea, the sea level rise at the end of the Ice Age, right, and they penetrated into upper parts of the cave that still were dry and found cave art that they've been dated directly by AMS radiocarbon dating to uh, the Salutrian period. It includes images of penguins in the Mediterranean, okay? That is an exceptional case. Uh, underwater archaeology is done in shallow waters, especially in the Baltic area, in the area a little bit of the North Sea uh, for Mesolithic and kind of terminal Paleolithic stuff. But, but Kosker is, is an exception, really um, an amazing case. Uh, anybody else? Yes, Joyce. Uh, we all have small amounts of Neanderthal DNA. Those of us who are of European or Asian origin have between two and four percent. They these these people. It's these very people. They tell us. What they show in this recent study that's coming out on May second is that uh, they have been able to trace the decline in the percentage of Neanderthal DNA through time. We are at, you know, 30,000 years after the extinction of the last Neanderthals, possibly in Andalusia and Gibraltar and southern Spain. We still have that small percentage. But you can trace it throughout the course of the Upper Paleolithic from an early, an early population of anatomically modern people who were found in a cave having been eaten by cave bears in uh, Romania, a place called Peștera Cuawaze that has been studied by my former UNM colleague, uh, Eric Trinkhaus. Uh, there, there's a very substantial amount of DNA of Neanderthals in what is nonetheless an anatomically modern person, juvenile who fell prey or something like that, uh, at about, uh, about 40,000 years ago. 
Yeah, she would, she would be included in that, yes, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's an even earlier anatomically modern find from Kostyenki in, um, where's Kostyenki in the Ukraine? I never can remember whether it's the Ukraine or Russia since, as Putin would say, they're all one and the same thing, right? Um, <laughs> there, at about 45,000 years ago, and there's, um, there, there's quite a lot of evidence of Neanderthal interbreeding there. One more, I think, just one more. Anybody else? Uh, hard to choose. I think your hand up went up first. As a what? Of a what? Oh, no, no, because that's the shape of a scapula. The, uh, it's a yeah. It's, uh, there are many of these in Altamira and El Julio and. In El Castillo, I mean, they, ours happens to be the biggest. It's a very large stag scapula. I do have a colleague in Zaragoza who uh, believes she does have a Paleolithic map of this same age. Uh, and in fact, I translated her article for her, and it made an enormous sensation. It was published in a very good journal. And there are other cases of that where we think, some people think, others are skeptical, but we think that they were drawing landmarks. Uh, on stones and on bones, there's a case from the Czech Republic, um, uh, and it's very possible. They must have navigated their way to sites, you know, and gotten, been, being able to get together for their aggregations and their big wingdings for finding mates and having big hunts and feasts and uh, sharing information and, and trading uh, goodies because of landmarks. That pyramidal shaped mountain in front of El Miron lines up directly with the axis of the cave and it probably had a lot of geographical meaning to them. They, they probably navigated and so why not? They may well have had maps but the, the scapulae are all of red deer and um, that's the shape of the scapula. I think we need to call it quits because it's late-ish. <laughs> so thank you very much once again. <laughs> I'm the Vice President for Research here at the University of New Mexico. Um, I've been on this job for, uh, well, since, since the beginning of the year, since January. And I have to say that um, this is uh, really one of the best parts of the job, um, uh, getting to meet uh, some of our uh, fantastic researchers and learning about their great work. So uh, it's, it's my great pleasure now to uh, conclude uh, the program uh, by presenting Professor Strauss with a citation in recognition of, the, recognition of his extraordinary work and the contributions to the University of New Mexico and to science. I would like to personally thank him for his efforts in enhancing our community through his research and teaching. And I would like to highlight once more that this is his 82nd and final semester of teaching. I wish him the best in his future endeavors, and I will now give him his nice uh, citation. Thank you, Lotte. Gracias. Un placer. Espero no haber defraudado. En España, por favor.